Uh, Mr. Baker, once again, thank you for uh, allowing me to do this interview. I really appreciate it. Can we hurry this up, please? I, oh, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask my questions as rapidly as possible. Let's get down to it then. Um, my first question for you, sir. Um, what is your background? How did you get involved in radio in the first place? Uh, my background is uh, I've always been an entertainer, um, and uh, I've always been in love with radio since I was a kid. I dreamt of being in radio from the time I was a kid. I used to, and a lot of guys in this industry will tell similar stories. I, I, I literally used to tape microphones to a broomstick, and I, and I would take that broomstick and I would sit it over a chair and I would put a phone book on it to hold it up. So, because you know the concept of a mic stand was, you know, very foreign uh, at that time, and and literally I would. I would uh, I would play records and I would announce I would tape it I would listen to it so I've always been obsessed with this business uh, since I was a kid I was really influenced by uh, top 40 radio out of Dallas uh, the McClendon stations they were always referred to KLIF KFJZ real high personality DJs and even though I've always loved music I didn't care about the music I wanted to hear what the announcer had to say. Did you come in from like a broadcast experience? Did you go to a school to, to learn broadcast? Yeah, yeah, I went to school for, for communications, um, and uh, but I've always been an entertainer. I mean, I've always been uh, a musician, stand-up comic, a writer, and uh, kind of the way this, this deal came about was that I, I knew that eventually I would end up in radio as an entertainer just because that, that's what I've always wanted to do. And uh, as a road comic, I, I, I would travel all over the country, and I listened to a lot of talk radio, because you spend a lot of time by yourself. And when, when you're by yourself, you, you crave someone to talk to. And I always found that, that listening to talk radio always gave me that guy in my car or that guy who was in a hotel room. It was just something to, you know, I would yell at the radio and, and the whole thing, but I also realized that, you know, that it was, uh, I, first I realized what a great medium it is. I mean, it's instant feedback. It's real-time dialogue, and, and there's nothing else on the planet like it. And I also realized that, that probably they could use more guys with a sense of humor, and that's, mm -hmm how the whole thing got started and, and I just uh, I knew you know from from my education I knew what it took to get into radio and I just basically uh, one day decided that I'm gonna make this move and within a couple of months I was working in big market radio it's kind of a Cinderella story so how long have you been doing actual ra talk radio uh, I've been doing actual talk radio probably going on uh, 20 years 20 years Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you probably got a, a lot of stories to tell and have volumes of advice for someone like me. You know, um, let me tell you something, man. Anybody that wants to get in this business, you it's it's just like any other aspect of show business. If you're working, you're successful. If you judge your success based on how much money you're making at the time, or what size market you're working in then all you're doing is you're holding yourself back. The most important thing <clears throat> in this business is that you have to be willing to work. Mm -hmm. And you have to make sure that your work is good. And everything else will take care of itself. You know, you'll, if you want to be a major market broadcaster, you're not going to become a major market broadcaster obsessing over becoming a major market broadcaster. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is make sure that 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 your show's a good show and yeah. if you're if you're doing segments make sure they're good because in showbiz the cream always rises to the top the guy who's willing to work always rises right to the top are there two hot button items that <clears throat> do you think a, a newcomer absolutely has to punch his ticket on is there is there some formula or do you think it's um, easier to to kind of have a different background rather than just coming from the um, the uh, you know the broadcast school what what you know I don't know you, you have to you have to be very curious I mean mm -hmm. it's it, you have to be very very curious and not and never really satisfied with with an answer sure. you know with your first answer I mean you have to 
you, you know, you have you have to have a variety of interests. You have to kind of be a jack of all trades, really. Sure. I mean, you you have you need to know about a lot of things. I mean, talk radio, music radio, are, are different animals. I mean, music you can always uh, when you run out of stuff to say or you get a little lost, you can just go to the music. Right. In talk radio, you got to have your act together. Sure. Um, but you also have to know a lot about everything. I mean, I spend all my time studying. That's all I do is study. That kind of is a good segue to my next question. What does a, a typical day for you look like? Um, how much preparation time do you have researching your stories versus on air versus other things? What, is, what does it look like? Well, uh, it, it's, you know, preparing a, uh, a show is, is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never ends. That's... Uh, there are very few similarities in uh, radio and, and say, stand-up. My background is as a stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. And people always like to try to compare the two, and you really can't because they're two different animals. There are a couple of similarities, and one of them is that as a comedian, you're always looking for material. You're always looking for references. You're always looking for jokes. You're looking for that perfect premise that will separate you from the pack. Sure. Talk radio is the exact same thing. You're looking for topics. You're looking for, you know, news stories. You're looking for things that people are going to be talking about. You know, talk radio, uh, it, it really is based on a triangle. And that triangle, it just, you know, you, you take your fingers and you got a triangle just like that. You got topical, relevant, and compelling. Mm -hmm. Topical, oh, what's going on in the world? Relevant, how does it relate to your audience? And then compelling is your delivery. And as long as a person remembers those three things, topical, relevant, and compelling, you're always going to have good momentum towards reaching your goal. That's interesting. Um, in your particular genre of uh, talk radio, there's a balance, obviously, between information that uh, your listeners can use and the entertainment value. What do you think is the, the balance that needs to be, and what's the focus? Well, <clears throat> you know, balance, there, there, there seems to be... Uh, a lot of discussion about balance and, and you can't enforce balance because people will disagree on one issue it doesn't mean that they would not agree on all issues sure it, it's you know balance mainly is uh, requested by those of the political class because talk radio especially talk radio is not convenient for them you know, when when a when a politician uh, comes into a talk radio show, that politician, if they don't know what they're talking about or if they're not ready, they're it, it's going to show immediately. If they don't know their issue, it's going to show immediately, and it doesn't always reflect well on them. So when people start talking about balance, you know, the the, the I think one of the great misconceptions about talk radio is that radio hosts don't want to hear from people who disagree. That is the furthest thing from the truth because sure. we're in the business of making good entertaining radio. Sure. Entertaining radio comes from when people disagree. You know, hearing your opinions parroted all day long, it's not entertaining. Sure. What's entertaining is a person on one side and a person on the other side having that discussion you know there's to me I love there's nothing I love more than a guy who's when I look on my call screener and I see a note that says this guy says you're the stupidest man on the planet I want to get to that guy as fast as possible because oh, yeah? you want to find out why sure and you know you, you have to have an incredibly thick skin to do this yeah and people are going to say hateful and and and, and bad things about you sure but they don't know you like, you know people don't know me I mean right. people know my show and I can't really say I'm, you know, my opinions are, are, are mine. I don't, I don't make things up to, sure. to try to stir things up or anything like that. My opinions are my opinions, but at least I'll, I can only speak for myself. On my radio shows, the conversation starts with my opinion. My opinion is, is the catalyst of a discussion or a debate and just a general conversation. No one has to agree with me. I don't care if you agree with me. I don't care. All I want is the dialogue, and sure. I want it to be entertaining and compelling because at the end of the day, our job is to entertain an audience. Right. Now, the mission of entertaining the audience, uh, 
you can't do certain things in order to accomplish that mission, such as lie. You can't lie right. in order to accomplish that mission because, one, an audience will smell you out immediately. The audience, you know, the thing that I've learned in 20 years of talk radio is that the audience is much smarter than, than people give them credit for. Sure. The average everyday people who are slugging it out every day in life are much more intelligent, they're much more versed on issues than, than, than people really give them credit for. Sure. So that's what I think makes our medium so valuable, that you know, if you sat back and listened to a talk show on, on an issue, you're going to learn something. And I learn something from my callers every day, especially people who disagree with me. You know, they, they come in, they disagree, they, sometimes it's cordial, sometimes it's not. But when they leave, there's always a little seed left that, that right. I go through later on, you know. To, oh, wow, you know, that guy, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. So, you know, talk hosts, they need people to disagree with them. They want people to disagree with them because, one, it makes really good radio. And number two, you might actually learn something. That's interesting because that kind of goes right into my next question. Um, obviously, ratings are important. You get ratings annually, but they don't really tell the whole picture. Um, what do ratings tell you about your connection to your audience, and what don't they say? Well, you know, now there's a new rating system called the People Meter, <clears throat> and there are those who believe that that's a more accurate uh, system of measurement because uh, basically the way the People Meter works is that uh, your radio signal sends out its own signal which is picked up by this pager known as the people meter, and then it measures, um, you know, how long a person listens. So the old method was uh, basically based on memory, where it was called the diary method, and they would send out these diaries, and then people would try to write down, let's see, I was listening to this at this time, and this at that time, and it's not really very accurate. Um, you know, what, is, what do ratings tell you? Well, if they're good ratings, they tell you exactly what, what the truth is, which, which is you're the greatest talent on the planet. Sure. If your ratings are not good, then obviously they're, they're missing it and they don't get it. And, you know, I mean, ratings, kind of, ratings are a snapshot of how you're doing. You know, uh, the interesting thing about it is you can, uh, you can overanalyze your ratings. You can overanalyze those measurements. When the reality is, if you work hard and you do good radio shows, you're going to get those ratings. You know, ratings don't appear overnight. You know, shows don't uh, uh, develop and bond with an audience overnight. I mean, it takes it takes at least three years, believe it or not, for a show to actually cement itself within a community and for people to become bonded with that show. I mean, because there's... As a radio host, you, know, you, you have a responsibility, and you, know, you have several, but one of them is that you are basically are you're your audience's friend. You know, sure. you're, you're like the audience's friend with, with a backstage pass, and that's not from an ego perspective. Mm -hmm. That's just from you know, people, I mean, if you think about it, just the concept that a person would say, oh, I'm in my car, I'm going to turn on my radio, I want to listen to that Chris Baker guy. That is, I can't even describe what, what, a, what an honor that is, that people would choose to do that. So in return, you owe them the responsibility of being their friend. You know, you need to, if you know something that you don't think they know, you got to tell them. Uh, if you have a perspective that, that you don't think they've heard, then you need to tell them that. Sure. And you also have to be willing to, if someone wants to call you and tell you you're a moron, you also have to be willing to take that right. and let them tell you why. You know, some guys you'll call, you know, a, a caller will call up and go, well, you're an idiot. And they'll go, well, you're an idiot. Boom, and you cut them off. Right. You don't know why. You know, so you owe them that. You owe them, you know, you owe them the ability to speak and tell you what they want to tell you. And you owe them, you know, the, the ability to, to make their point, you know. Right. I mean, you're always juggling time in radio because... There are things we call we all call formatics, which as you have, you know, you have break times that are specific for that show and that radio station, and the challenge is to try to get as much dialogue, conversation, and phone calls into a specific amount of time before you have to go to your commercial break. We're only here to fill time between commercials. That's right. what we do. Um, so you really have to, you know, you you, you gotta you sometimes have to redirect the conversation or, uh, you know, you have to kind of push someone to hurry up 
because you want them to make their point, but you're always limited by time. And, and, and you know, you owe them uh, the, the ability to, to allow them to talk so that they get their point across, because if you think about it, as a host, you're on the air three to five hours a day per, you know, on a show. Yeah. A caller is just there for a minute. A minute. You know, so, I mean, you, you know, you, you, you can't just shout guys down. I mean, it does happen because sure. you get passionate. But, you know, you, you have to listen to your audience because you'll learn something from them. Uh, and like I said, they're only there for that very tiny window. You don't want them to go away thinking, well, I didn't get to say what I wanted to say. Right. You know. Um, there's been some talk about uh, the uh, fairness doctrine, uh, bringing that back. It kind of disappeared in the 80s uh, under Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. and now it's, it's, there's talk about it coming back. What's your opinion of it? Um, and uh, what do you think it effect it will have on talk radio or any kind of radio? Well, they'll kill talk radio. Okay, that, that, that's just dead. I mean, they'll kill talk radio. And to, to try to bring back a fairness doctrine, in fact, what they're doing now is they're, they're not calling it a fairness doctrine. They're calling it uh, localization of radio. And they like to say that talk radio doesn't really examine the issues and, and we're not serving our community. Well, I would disagree with them. We are examining issues and we are serving our community, but we're also in the entertainment business. Sure. And just because some pseudo-intellectual in Washington doesn't understand why we're not sitting around talking about narcoleptic spotted owls, you know, <laughs> no one cares about narcoleptic <laughs> spotted owls. What they do care about is their tax money. They do care about jobs. They do care about their families. They do care about their television shows. And that's what we do. We talk about things that, you know, that, that, are, that are part of people's lives. Sure. And just because some politician thinks we ought to all be obsessing over, you know, spotted owls and, and, you know, other useless nonsense, they're not right. They don't know. They're not in this business. They don't do this job. You can't get them on the shows. Uh, we're coming up on 500 days that we've been trying to get Al Franken to come on this show. Won't do it. It won't come anywhere near this radio show. Really? There are many politicians that won't come on a talk radio show to save their life. Yet, these are the same jerks that are talking about fairness and balance. They're the ones that are making the news, and they're the ones that are setting policy. We invite them to come on our shows. Right. We have questions for them. They don't want to answer them, and they're worried that if they come on a radio show, that if someone asks them a question they can't answer, then they look stupid, so they just don't come, but then they sit around and talk about where's the fairness, where's the balance. Right. The balance, it, it comes in a couple of different ways. The true balance, it, number one, it comes in the way of people making a conscious decision to listen to what they want to listen to. Mm -hmm. You can't make someone listen to something they don't want to listen to. Sure. Why? I mean, politicians, we want them to listen to us, they choose not to. So who the hell are they to tell us we have to listen to this nonsense? The other, the other part of balance is the caller. I mean, if you disagree with a radio host, the, there's no other medium that, that you can instantly jump in and tell a guy that you disagree or jump in and tell a guy where he's wrong. Right. You can't do it to an editorial writer. You can't do it to, you know, one of these nationally syndicated columnists. You can't do it to face the nation. Sure. You can't do it to, you know, you can't watch the TV news and say, Wait a minute, I was there. That didn't happen. You, you can't do right. that. Talk radio, you can listen and hear a host say something, and, 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 and that completely either you agree with or disagree with, but you can just pick up your phone and call in that show and tell that guy where he's wrong. Right. And you know what? They're going to take your call because it makes good radio. So the, the fairness doctrine is, is basically it's censorship. It's been used like that in the past. Richard Nixon used it in the past. Right. Okay? Both political parties have, have used that so-called fairness doctrine to their advantage. Um, now, um, you know, they want to bring it back because they say, well, there's not enough liberals, quote-unquote, in, in talk radio. Well, guess what? If they were entertaining, they would be in talk radio. Right. Rush Limbaugh is Rush Limbaugh not because he's a conservative, but he's, it's because he's entertaining. You know, uh, Sean Hannity's not Sean Hannity because he's uh, a conservative. He's because he's entertaining and he's good at what he does. Sure. And, you know, there are entertaining liberals that do talk radio. But the, here's the problem. The fact is that 
a large number of, of liberal positions don't stand up to scrutiny. Right. And, you know, look at our our current health care debate. You know, the 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 rap is is that well, everybody deserves health care. Well guess what? Everyone can get health care. The real issue is they don't want to pay for it. Right. I mean, you can sit here and hash it out all day of who has access to the hospital and who has access to this doctor and who has access to this. Everyone has access. No one is denied treatment. You show up at a, at a hospital looking for treatment, they treat you. The issue is not the treatment. The issue is who's going to pay for it. Right. Now, when you get your supporter, in which I've done, you bring in your supporter of, you know, government health care or whatever. You bring them in studio and then you ask them, are people getting treated? The answer, well, yes. Is anyone denied treatment and dies? Well, no. Okay, so then really it's all about who pays for it, right? Right. Well, technically, yes. Okay, why should I pay for your health care? They can't answer that question. What about people, what they, they say things about, and this is kind of getting off the subject, but, um, uh, you know, paying for uh, uh, their health care will bankrupt them because of the cost of health care. What do you say about that? Not necessarily. I mean, look, you know, we all face bankruptcy from a variety of, uh, 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 you know, a variety of ways. Um, look at the businesses that are going into bankruptcy because all of a sudden government decides to start regulating them out of business. Look right. at what they're doing to the coal industry, the oil industry, the national gas industry. I have a friend right now in Houston, Texas, uh, who has an energy company. He's going out of business. Why? Because he's been regulated out of business. So about 27 people are going to lose their job. Right. How are they going to pay for anything? They're going to go bankrupt. You know what? And look, the bottom line is, in, in every little life, you know, some rain must fall sometimes. Right. If you face a catastrophe, you face a catastrophe. No amount of government, no amount of government regulation is going to head that off. Sure. It's not going to head off a hurricane. It's not going to head off a tornado. Devastating uh, health care. You know, or, or should I say? Uh, a health care emergency. That's part of life, man. Right. And, you know, so, okay, let me get this right. Does it, is it okay that, that, uh, uh, that I, you know, I, Chris Baker, who, you know, I've got three kids to take care of. I've got a trophy wife to take care of, right? <laughs> Why, oh, what, i got to cut in on all that because some guy over there is worried that he might have to have his tonsils out? It just, it, 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 it it doesn't hold up to an argument because basically the argument is we believe we should take from you because and that's it yeah how's that that argument doesn't hold up second to last question yeah um does pickles actually exist uh, why <laughs> does she speak chicken uh pickles speaks chicken uh, well let me just show you i'll show you pickles pickles the original pickles was an intern and uh i just thought it would be funny you know, as part of the, uh, uh, you know, radio is a lot of theater of the mind. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, basically radio, just like this is another similarity of comedy, and that is that you paint pictures with words. Sure. And you paint pictures with words, and you try to paint them in as few, in as detailed, but in as few words as possible. Yeah. And in comedy, you go set up to punchline as quick as possible, you know. And in fact, in comedy, there's a science to writing jokes. Uh, you come up with a premise, you write out your joke, and then what you do is you start subtracting words. Right. You know, what we always would refer to as useless words. Radio is very similar because you want to get to your point as quick as possible. Right. Um, so Pickles, I thought it would be funny as a big mouth radio host to have a receptionist that I could call and tell her to do stuff. Right. You know, and ridiculous things, you know, like call the president and tell him I want to talk to him. Okay, Chris, no problem. Right. That's just funny, right? So then, uh, so anyway, so we had an intern cut a bunch of lines. And so now, let me see if I can, let me find her. We have, so here's Pickles. This is where Pickles actually exists now because the intern's no longer with us. I don't think that, uh, I don't have my board up, I guess. So basically, you just pull up her voice, you ask yeah, her questions. Yeah, I just pull up her voice, she, I ask questions, she comes up with and, and, and I have various answers. And then we had, a, uh, we had a local political writer who goes on a radio show saying that words like personal responsibility are, are code racist language. Yeah. Which, that's bull crap, so I call the guy out and ask him to come on the show and explain it, and he won't. So now, instead of having him on the show, we just have a chicken sound effect. And then, of course, in order to have 
a guy speaking chicken, you have to have someone to translate, and, translate chicken, right. and we figured pickles would be able to do that, so that's how it all happened. But it's really the whole thing is on a little button bar, and I just hit buttons and sure. and play along with it. But to the audience, it's all theater of the mind, and right. that's the only reason. That's, that's what it is. So talking about theater of the mind, the real question is, how do you think of stuff like this? Do you have epiphanies on your way home, or yes. do you uh, have brainstorming uh, sessions at the office? Okay, how do we make fun of this issue? You know, I, I'm just a, I'm basically a 12-year-old, so that helps. Uh, you know, second of all, I, I mean, you know, uh, God blessed me with a good sense of humor. Cool. And, uh, you know, when God gives you something like that, then uh, obviously you need to use it. So I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a sarcastic, skeptical kind of guy. And, you know, the great thing is, is that I work with other guys who are really good guys and fun guys. And sometimes, you know, we brainstorm, but most of it is... You know, me uh, looking at the news and thinking about stuff and making notes. And, and I talk to my producer every night around 8, 30, 9 o'clock. And, and we go through things, and, and it just kind of happens. You know, I, I would say that my radio show is, is really, uh, it's not an orchestrated show. It's a real fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants stream of conscious monologue and phone calls. And, sure. Uh, you know, we, we write a lot of... Uh, parody bits and songs and things like that, but that goes to my background as a comedian. I mean, I've written uh, for, you know, television shows and things like that, so I mean, that's just what I do, and and and, uh, and it's fun, you know, I mean, it's really, especially the song, we do a lot of great songs, and mm -hmm. those are a lot of fun to make. Sure. You know. Last kick of the cat, any more advice for this intern trying to break into radio? Well, uh, I will tell you that it's it's a very very tough industry, but it's also an industry that needs people who are willing to work. And in any aspect of show business, and I've said this to anyone, the, my entire showbiz career, whether a guy wanted to be an actor, or a comic, or a musician, or a writer, whatever, all you have to do is make up your mind that you want to do this and start working. And what ends up happening is somewhere down the road, you realize, wow, I'm making money at this. Sure. It's what happened to me. You know, I started out as a comedian. I didn't make any. I made nothing. I was just showing up anywhere I could get stage time and working on my craft. Same thing when I started doing talk radio. Uh, I got paid, you know, for doing shows, but it started out on a Saturday. Yeah. And it was a Saturday, Sunday. And then Saturday, Sunday turned into a Monday through Friday with an extra Saturday. And then from there, I, I decided I would, you know, try a different market and establish myself. And um, if you're willing to work, you'll get what you want. But on the way there, you can't focus about where you are and where you should be. Sure. Focus on your work, and the rest of it will take care of itself. Now, there are people who are going to tell you that that's not true. Well, I'm going to guess that people who tell you that's not true are people who are very obsessed with where am I and why didn't I get that gig and how come that guy's doing that and I'm not. You focus on your work and make sure your work is good, whatever your work may be.